Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Breaking the Now. Today, it's just with me, Justin. Sarang and Surrey are busy off doing other things. You'll have to catch them in a future episode. But today, I'm talking about a very important topic, subaddress association. I'm going to talk about two main types of subaddress association. Association that can be done off-chain and association that can be done on-chain based off transaction data and how you assume different sub-address entities are associated. Let's jump straight into the first one, which is something that in the Monero community we're calling the Janus attack. So let's look at this transaction uh, graph you know, here. So let's say that Eve works for an employer that sells Chicago Cubs hats. And Eve also runs a side business, Entity One, that sells Chicago White Sox hats, okay? You know, huge, huge no-no going on here, right? So let's say Eve's employer starts to become suspicious that Eve is running a side business. Eve's employer could generate a transaction that sends funds to the Entity One. Suppose the Entity One automatically processes the transaction as any, you know, transaction processing software would do. But if Eve's employer constructs a transaction in such a way that the entity one only receives it if both Eve's um, salary receiving address from the employer and the entity one payment acceptance address are derived from the same seed, then Eve's employer is able to learn some more information. So let me take a real small step back, summarize that again, because I know it got complicated. Eve's employer will try and determine whether or not the address that the employer uses to pay Eve's salary and the address provided by the Entity 1 are, are generated, are derived from the same master Monero seed. To do so, Eve's employer can generate a transaction sent to Entity 1, but Entity 1 only receives it if this sub-address with Entity 1 and the sub-address uh, sent to Eve for salary payments are controlled by the same seed. Eve's employer would know if this was the case if Entity 1, the payment processor component, processes the payment and, and continues on, then Eve's employer would know it was successful. If the Entity 1 payment processor does not report receiving any transaction, Eve's employer would know that the funds that were sent to the to the Entity 1 um, were lost forever, and the, the sub-addresses uh, that Eve controls personally and the sub-address used uh, by the Entity 1 were derived from two separate seeds. So let's go through another, uh, so in this case, of course, you know, Eve's employer was able to note that these two are related to the same seed, but let's go through the example where Eve is pretty smart and she uses a separate seed for entity one instead of the same seed. So, you know, it's still related to Eve. That's what this gray line is for instead of the blue line. But instead of a sub address, entity one has its entire own set of uh, private keys, its own seed. So if Eve's employer tries to send a transaction to entity one that only goes through if Eve's personal sub address is also part of the same seed, you would note that it would not go through, and therefore Eve's employer is not able to create this sub-address association. Let's take a look at it from a third example with exchange information. So suppose Eve this time uh, wants to depo deposit funds on an exchange, so she opens up an exchange deposit account. The exchange gives Eve a deposit sub-address for her to use to identify payments uh, that she makes on the exchange. Um, however, let's say a sub address comes across from a friend and she wants to know if this sub address is an exchange sub address, if it's provided by the same exchange. Well, what Eve could do is she could construct a transaction to herself so she can send a transaction to her own sub address that is provided by the exchange on the left there, but she can make it such that it's only received there if the second middle deposit sub-address is actually derived from the same seed also. So if Eve is able to notice that she uh, sees funds show up in her account, she can confirm that the second sub-address she was provided 
is also an exchange account derived from the same seed. However, if she is not credited funds, she would know that they're lost forever and that the second sub address is not associated um, is not associated with the exchange's same seed. So that's another way where at relatively little cost and uh, by Eve providing her own confirm because she is sending funds to herself essentially that, uh, you know, through the exchange that uh, she's able to learn uh, or sort of scan sub addresses as they come in to see, uh, again, at little cost, whether or not they're related to specific exchanges. Uh, again, here you can see that if it was successful, she would know that the deposit address to is linked to an exchange. Now, I want to make one thing really, really clear because I know a lot of people make this mistake. When I'm referring to sub address association, I'm referring to the links between the identities that are behind the sub addresses. I am not referring to transactions that are associated with the sub addresses. This is really, really important. So. If you're able to make associations like this between sub addresses, you still have no idea which transactions are associated with these sub addresses. So keep that in mind. That is still something that the attackers have no knowledge of. So what requirements are necessary to pull off a Janus attack? Well, so first you need to know that Eve is using a sub address that is connected to a single private key um, or a single seed uh, is an easier way to think about it. Um, the accounts are irrelevant, so it doesn't matter how they're derived from the seed, whether it's a sub-address in one account or another account, as long as it's a, as it's a sub-address from the seed, it's susceptible, so keep that in mind. Uh, second, you have to know that the attacker is knowledgeable of the sub-address's existence in the first place and would have a reason to test it. You can't generate a sub-address on your computer, never give it to anyone else, and then be attacked because no one else knows what the sub address is. Um, so keep in mind who you're giving the sub addresses to. You may have far less exposure than you think. Um, and then if, if that's the case, then the attacker would perhaps try to create a transaction that is received by Eve if both sub addresses are derived from the same seed. Um, and then on the third point there, there has to be a confirm. So whether or not it is Eve confirming, yes, I received the transaction manually or, or programmically, um, not pragmatically, um, or whether it's the case that, uh, you know, it's the exchange issuance where the attacker is able to provide their own confirm because they have visibility over one of the sub addresses derived from the seed. Um, there just needs to be some way to confirm it actually went through because otherwise the transaction will be lost and, and there's no actual connection there. So those are the three things you need to, to focus on, uh, the three attack requirements for the Janus attack to be successful in the current state of Monero. So what are some mitigations that users can do? Well, the first two are protocol level changes that uh, Monero has not implemented and there still is some debate over whether or not they should be implemented for efficiency reasons because they add additional transaction size. So the first is to encrypt the TX private key and send it as part of the transaction, uh, the second option is to publish a SNOR signature proving knowledge of the TX private key corresponding to the published TX public key on a specific base point. I'm not going to get into either of those specifics for this episode. This is supposed to be pretty simple. Sarang and Surrey will be able to answer questions along with several others in the Monero Research Lab IRC channel if you have additional questions there. However, in relation to things people can do right now, I bolded a few of the, the main ones that people can do that are realistic. So first, if you can, do not confirm receipt of funds. If someone's like, hey, did I send funds to you? You don't necessarily have to say yes, right? So um, keep that in mind that if you are not confirming receipt of funds and you're the only one that has access to sub addresses derived from that seed, then there's no way for an attacker to prove that these are actually associated. Uh, the fourth point here, uh, if you really are one that is worried about the disassociation of your identities, um, such let's say you're Eve and you're running a, a separate um, after work uh, company, well then you should be using seeds that are derived, you know, completely different seeds, and you should be using sub addresses derived from different seeds, depending on what identity you're, you're trying to use. So um, definitely the best protection you can do now is to use separate seeds if you're willing to compromise in the, on that usability front. Fifth point is just don't share exchange deposit sub addresses with others, right? Like 
tell a friend to send funds to a sub address that you control and then send it to the exchange. Um, otherwise, it's really trivial for most people to be able to test whether or not a sub address is related to an exchange at relatively low cost. Uh, the sixth point is, in general, in addition to exchange sub addresses, you can just be mindful of who you're giving the sub addresses to. Um, if, if, if they are people you generally trust or they're people that you are more worried about, for the more worried of counterparties, you should consider using a different seed um, such that they're not trying to you know, collude to, to connect some of your identities together, um, especially if you're negotiating under the pretense of it being a different identity. And then the seventh point is, there may be something else clever that we've thought of after this video came out, so certainly stay up to date in relation to how sub addresses provide protections and what they mean for ultimate users, because it's very likely that people have come up with some other solution that just you know, hasn't come out before this video. So keep that in mind too. So just to help quell everyone's nerves, I'm going to walk through sort of the different levels of protections provided by different address uses um, for off-chain uh, learning of information, because I know that people uh, are like, wait, I thought sub addresses were like perfect and now they're not. So uh, this helps clarify things for people. For most people, you don't need to worry. There's still reasonable level of protection provided by sub addresses with a really lovely user experience. Um, however, for the people who are willing to go a step further, you still have the option of using a separate seed. And we'll talk about what those uh, specific benefits are. So if you are reusing your main address that starts with four, or you are using an integrated address, um, integrated addresses are derived from the main address. So everyone, or everyone is able to derive the main address when given an integrated address. Uh, so if you give one integrated address to one person and then another one to another user, they're able to know they're the same uh, main address then they might provide some protection against a passive observer, right? They, they would only be known um, if you publish it publicly, let's say. Um, if you don't publish it publicly and you only deal with counterparties, well, then perhaps you don't even need to worry. Um, however, once you start dealing with counterparties, whether malicious or not, they're able to determine, you know, hey, I've seen this address before. <laughs> like, I know who gave it to me in the past. Now I know you're giving it to me. So I'm able to connect these identities together um, based off the address that these people have provided. Um, so for any type of counterparty interaction, you're much, much better off using sub addresses. And you're still better off using them um, against passive observers too, if you're publishing addresses online, uh, for instance, because of passive observers um, you know, are, are less likely to receive access to information. Um, now, for the malicious counterparty component, this is someone who is actively trying to learn more information about you and are willing to burn funds in the process. Um, sub addresses might not be the best case uh, when, do, when you're interacting with these malicious counterparties. Um, however, of course, it depends on what access to information these counterparties have. If they know the sub address they use to pay you, but they don't know of any other of your sub addresses, I mean, there's no other identity that they can reasonably try and link to you. Um, so uh, it's dependent on the access to information there, the availability of information to this malicious counterparty. However, if you are concerned that malicious counterparties are able to get access to several different sub address information and are willing to test those, you should be separating your different identity, um, your different identities by using separate seeds as possible. That provides the highest degree of protection against malicious counterparties. Um, but of course, it's kind of frustrating to log into many different Monero accounts. And so for most users, sub addresses still are a really, really good way to help manage your offset. You have to remember a few years ago with Monero, everyone was using integrated addresses and sub addresses weren't the thing. So sub addresses still provide an enormous user experience benefit for users offsec over what uh, previous solutions were available, where it was just perhaps unrealistic for a user to have a separate seed all the time, right? So now that we've talked about the off-chain uh, sub-address association, let's talk about some of the on-chain stuff. So you will note that this looks very, very similar to the poisoned output attack, and that's because it does effectively function the same way. Let's say Eve, up here is sending funds to a large number of sub addresses and Alice controls all of these sub addresses and Eve is 
sort of suspicious, let's say, and wants some on-chain data to help prove that Alice is associated with these sub-addresses. Um, in this case, we're going to have Eve collaborate with an exchange. So this is very, very similar to the EAE attack that we described in the previous episode. Um, so let's say Eve sends funds to one account, um, so to one sub-address that is selling, uh, selling Chicago Cubs hats. And there are several transactions that each use this ultimate result, uh, this, this output that she sent. Um, and then one of them, Alice transfers to the exchange there. Um, let's say then that Eve sends a second transaction to a Chicago White Sox store that goes to Alice and then Alice deposits on her exchange account, then a St. Louis account, and then finally, you know, a Minneapolis Twins account. So, or, you know, Twin Cities, uh, Twin Cities account. So in this case, if Eve's able to work with the exchange, they might say, okay, the likelihood that these sub-addresses all are connected to one person depositing funds on the exchange makes it very clear that Alice is the individual or entity that has very likely control over all of these sub-addresses. So that's, that's some way that Eve and the exchange are able to work together to learn and more information. Now let's, let's sort of take the exchange out of it. I'll still keep the exchange on the slide for convenience, but let's say Eve is just generally curious and Alice is a little bit less intelligent in this example. So um, Eve is going to send the same transactions as before, but Alice takes all of these accounts, you know, all, all the funds that they received and combines them in a single transaction, uh, like groups all the outputs together before sending it to the exchange. Well, then Eve might say, okay, what is the likelihood that a single transaction contains all of the outputs that I sent to all of these different sub-addresses and that they were all included in distinct individual rings? You know, that the money sent to the Cubs sub-address is in one ring, the Sox sub-address is in another ring. Like, this is not likely to happen by chance. And so Eve might use that as evidence to state that, uh, you know, Alice is... Uh, or, all, or all of these four accounts are related to one shared entity based on the way that the transaction graph appears, based off the way that Alice constructed these transactions. So um, again, in this particular example, Eve might not even know Alice's identity necessarily, but Eve would know based off the transaction graph information that there is some likely connection between these four different stores. They're likely owned by a shared entity. All right, so we've gone over the basics. I want I want to end with a summary here. So uh, first, sub addresses are better at providing unlinkability than integrated addresses, but they're not perfect. Um, and power users should use addresses derived from independent seeds for the best privacy, but this does come at the cost of convenience. So uh, just know what the limitations are. If you are uh, sort of dealing with higher risk things with Monero, you should certainly understand what the limitations are and be willing to use separate seeds as needed um, in order to keep your identities uh, distinct. Um, and then the third point is really important. And this comes, you know, the on, this is related to the on-chain transaction graph stuff I'm talking about. For the on-chain stuff, it wasn't a direct sub-address link that impacted users and, and related it to one entity. Instead, it was what the entity did on chain with their transactions that linked these sub addresses together. So sub addresses alone don't magically remove the concerns with on chain matching. All of the concerns that we've talked about in the past episodes of Breaking Monero, and I'm sure we'll talk about in future other episodes too. So they're a really effective tool that can be beneficial to help prevent unlinkability, but they don't solve the problem entirely. There's many things that work together to help, uh, you know, attackers learn information about transactions. So keep all of these things in mind. Um, you might be, you know, setting transactions just among trusted counterparties, but an outside observer might know that the graph looks weird. And so they might be able to use that as, as useful information. Um, the fourth, po uh, fourth point, I, I want to emphasize that stealth addresses function as desired for most use cases. So in terms of sub addresses provide, sorry, um, I meant to say sub addresses there, not stealth addresses uh, in both of those cases. So um, sub addresses do in fact really, really help 
to allow normal users, you know, casual users of Monero have much better OPSEC than using integrated addresses at very, very low effort. Um, so for all of those users, you can carry on pretty well assured knowing that this is a, a relatively niche attack and that sub addresses probably are providing the types of protections that you're hoping for. And then the fifth case is, you know, just very basic. Don't share exchange addresses, um, sub addresses, because there's no reason to just, just use your own sub address as an intermediary if needed. And then take note of who you give your sub addresses to um, that are derived from specific seeds. If you have some idea of what your type of sub address exposure is, it can help you manage it a lot better. All right. So that's all I wanted to cover today for this episode of Breaking Monero. I know we covered some pretty interesting stuff today, at least in my opinion, some off and on-chain uh, transaction um, association and sub address association. So I had a fun time and I hope that you enjoyed it. We'll catch you in the next episode of Breaking Monero. Take care.